So let's go ahead and look at this next example. y equals sine of 2x. Let's sketch its graph. So here we're not in vertical or horizontal shifts anymore. We're into the stretching and compressing part. So let's just see if we can sketch this before we summarize vertical and horizontal stretching and compressing. So y equals sine of 2x. Well, I'll start with sine of x because I know what the sketch of that looks like. So we'll start with sine of x, and this will be pi by 2 pi 3 pi by 2 and 2 pi, and then I would continue on. And it continues on in the other direction as well. So what does sine look like? Well, it starts at 0, goes up to 1, back down to 0, down to negative 1, back to 0, and so on. So that's 1, and that's negative 1. And that's y equals sine of x. Now what about y equals sine of 2x? Well, I think about it this way. I think, again, like we did above. If I know a point on the original one, what's the corresponding point on my new function? So let's look at this point here. When x is pi by 2, I know the output of the sine function is 1. What would be the corresponding point I'd know on this new function, sine of 2x? Well, I'd need the x value to be such that when I multiply it by 2, I get it to be pi by 2, because that's the corresponding input I know for the sine function, which gives an output of 1. So what value of x when I plug in multiply by 2 gives pi by 2? Well, that would be pi by 4. So pi by 4. And so that point on my original sine function corresponds to this point on my sine of 2x function. And we see that really what's happening here is all of these points are moving to the right. In fact, there's this compression happening. If it, if it was way out here, if it was way out here on the, for negative x values, they'd be pushed towards the vertical axes as well. So we got this compression happening here by a factor of 2. So this goes up, hits 1, and then come down and hits 0. And then we've got the rest of it looking like this. And so on. Notice that everywhere the original function was 0, my new function is still 0 there. But there's these extra roots that happened halfway between the two roots. And it would go off in this direction as well. So that is our graph of y equals sine 2x. So it was our original function compressed by a factor of 2. That's what that 2 did. It was a compression factor. OK, so here's the summary of vertical and horizontal stretching and reflecting as well, thrown in at the end. So again, we're going to suppose c is positive. In fact, in this case, we're going to suppose that c is bigger than 1, because then things like 1 over c, we know that they're positive numbers smaller than 1. So when y is equal to c times f, that's a stretch. c is bigger than 1, so this is a stretch of our original function in the vertical direction. 1 over c would be a compression factor in the vertical direction. If they are multiplied to x as the argument into the function, then these are horizontal compressions and stretches. And if we've got these negative signs, if it's on the outside of the function, so it's the last thing you do before you get your output, then that's a reflection along the horizontal, or about the horizontal axis, so it's this sort of reflection in the vertical direction. Whereas if the negative sign appears of the variable before you put it into the function, then that's a reflection about the vertical axis. So there's a summary of our vertical, horizontal stretching and reflecting. Now you can
play with one of these applets, which is on our course website containing all of these applets. And here we've got our original function sign and our transform function. So these are all the different uh, ways you can transform. You can take your variable, subtract x from it, and then multiply the result by c, and then plug that into the function, and then multiply by d and add b. So the things you do before you pop them into the function are going to affect the horizontal, stretching, reflecting, translations, and all that. And the things after, so the things you do to the result that comes out of f, are things that are going to affect the vertical direction, so compression or expansions or stretching, and also the shifts as well. So D and B are going to affect vertical things, and C and A are going to affect horizontal things. So let's have a look. And you can play with these things. What if I affect B? What's going to happen there? Well, that would be my vertical translations. What about if I affect A? That's our horizontal translations. Well, what about C? Well, C is our compression factor. If we take it to be bigger, it'll compress it by that factor. And same with D. D is our vertical stretching factor. So you can play with these to get an idea of how each of these affects the graph. Okay, so let's put them all together in one last example. Here we've got the sketch of a graph, F, and we want to find the sketch of the graph of this function, one-half of f of x minus 4, and then take away 8 from that. So there's f. How do we get the graph of this thing? So again, I just want to note, I can go ahead and look at this and say, okay, well, minus 4, that's a horizontal translation, uh, minus 8, that's a vertical translation, the half, that's a scaling factor. We can do that, and we'll do that in a second. But again, I want you to think carefully about why those transformation rules actually work. Why the, if I take x minus 4, why that's a shift to the right. If I take 8 away from the result, why that's a shift down. If I take a half, why that's a scaling factor. And it all comes from this fact. So let's look at a point on this graph. So we know 2, 4 is a point on y equals f of x. What is the corresponding point on y equals one half of f of x minus four minus eight? What's the corresponding point I know over here? So if I think 2, 4 is the only thing I know about this function. I know that if I put 2 into it, 4 comes out. Pretend that's the only thing I know. Just ignore the rest of the graph here. Pretend that's the only thing I know. Then what's the only thing I know about this new function? Well, I think to myself, I think, okay, if all I know is f of 2, if I know that if I plug 2 in, 4 comes out, then if I look down here, then I have to choose x so that x minus 4 is 2, because that's the only thing I know f of. I know f of 2. That's it. So I'd have to choose x so that x minus 4 is 2. So we have to choose x such that x minus 4 is 2. So that means we'd have to choose x to be 6. So that's the x coordinate of the point that I know on this function. What's the corresponding y coordinate? Well, we plug it in. So that would be then 1 half of f of 6 minus 4, so that's 2, minus 8. And so what is that? That is f of 2 is 4, 4 minus 8 is negative 4, a half of that is negative 2. So that's 6, negative 2. So this point here, this point here on our original function would move to a point at 6 and negative 2. So it would be down here. So I already know where that point goes. And we could play this game. We could do that for all the points along here, or these special points, and plot them, and then connect them up. 
That's really the idea behind those transformation properties. They tell us how to do this all at once. So this is the underlying idea. This is the underlying understanding of where those transformation properties come from. Follow what a point goes to. Follow what another point goes to. Follow what all points go to. So let's go ahead and do that. So what do we got? I'm going to jot them down here and I'm going to add the rest of the stuff to my diagram. So maybe I'll add a few more things here. It looks like the graph's going to appear below the axes. In fact, we, we know that it shifts down by negative 8, so it's probably going to come below the axes. So negative 5, and we'll continue on. Negative 6, negative 7, negative 8, negative 9, and negative 10. Let's see if that will do it. And this was 6 here. Okay, so we start with our function f. And what's the first thing we do? Let's think of how we can start with f and eventually get to this function here, 1 half f of x minus 4 minus 8. Well, the first thing we do is we change the argument to x minus 4. So this gives us a shift of 4 units to the right. Okay, so the whole graph shifts four units to the right. So this point two now shifts out here to six. Point at four goes out here to eight. And the point at five goes out to nine. So this one goes out here to eight. And this one up here goes out to nine. And it still looks like the same shape. So that's step one. Now, what do we have? Well, the next thing we do, again, I'm trying to work up to this entire function here. So the next thing we do is we take 8 away from it. So that becomes f of x minus 4, the function we had in part 1. Take away 8. So that now shifts down 8 units. So it takes the result of step one and shifts it down eight units. So it takes all these points and shifts them down. So this one, which is at three, is now at negative five. This one, which is at four, is at negative four. This one, which is at six, is now at negative two. So that should line up with the nine there, so I'll make it a little bit bigger. Okay, and so, and again, we connect them all up, so. looks like this. Okay, so that's our graph after step two. And then our final one, which I'll draw in a different color, three, takes this previous one and multiplies it by a half. So what does that do? That compresses it vertically by a half. So this point, which has y coordinate negative 4, now becomes a y coordinate of negative 2. Ah, that's the point we already worked out. What about this one here? Well, it's negative 5, so half of that would be negative 2 and a half. And this one here, which is of negative 2, now becomes negative 1. So it's going to be right there. And I'll rewrite the number 9 in just up here, so it's out of the way. And every other point as well has a y-coordinate, which is half of the original. So it's a compression. So it looks like this. So there is our graph. And that's number three. It's our last graph there. And so that's the graph that we wanted. That's the graph of y equals one-half f of x minus 4 minus 8. So I'll separate this off so we don't get confused there. Okay, so that was just uh, one example where we sort of summarized all the transformations all in one go. Um, we didn't start with an original formula for our function, and this was just to illustrate how these transformation properties actually get performed. We do them step by step. We look at how we get from one function to the one we want, 
and we do it in pieces and step by step applying the appropriate transformation as we go along. All right, so now we're going to look at how to combine two or more functions together using arithmetic operations and also we'll talk about function composition.